Welcome to the Healthcare Executive Podcast, providing you with insightful commentary and developments in the world of healthcare leadership. To learn more, visit ACHE.org. And without further ado, your host. Hello again, everyone. Welcome to the Healthcare Executive Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Sperling. Today's episode is brought to you by Elsevier. As misinformation multiplies, giving your clinicians easy access to the most trusted, current, evidence-based information is more important than ever. Elsevier's Clinical Key can help. Download the executive brief at trustclinicalkey.com. All right, our guest today is Odette Balano, president and CEO of St. Alphonsus Health System in Boise, Idaho. She provides executive leadership and strategic and operational oversight for a 610-bed, five-hospital system across Idaho and Oregon. Prior to joining St. Alphonsus, she served as senior vice president of Kaiser Permanente East Bay in Oakland. An active civic and community leader, Odette serves as a board member for the Idaho Hospital Association and Boise Metro Chamber of Commerce, among others. She is also an active member of the Carol Emmett Fellowship Board. That is a national organization committed to mentoring exceptional women leaders to achieve their highest potential and influence as leaders in healthcare. Odette earned her master's degree in administration of healthcare services from the University of Houston Clear Lake and a bachelor of science degree in nursing from Texas Christian University. She is also board certified in healthcare management as an ACHE fellow and will be delivering the address at the Thomas C. Dolan Diversity Breakfast during the upcoming Congress on Healthcare Leadership that will be March 28th through the 31st in Chicago. Odette, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me, Eric. All right, we're going to get right into it. Uh, We mentioned in the introduction that you'll be delivering an address at upcoming Congress, and it's going to focus on the role of the C-suite and the board in helping drive health equity. So without giving too much information away here on the podcast, Tell us how you've worked with your own board to impact patients and communities. Yes, thank you for that question. So it really truly starts in the boardroom and talking to our board and making the commitment that we would look at our makeup to reflect how um, our community um, is represented at the table was a first step in looking at health equity and all our goals and strategies around diversity, equity, and inclusion. So if you don't have a diverse uh, voice on your board, you can't really understand the needs of the communities that you serve. And so while sometimes people talk about, well, these are just quotas, my answer has always been, until you meet the requirement of having a diverse board that is representative of your community, you can't start the conversations. And I would say that it is not only about gender and ethnicity, but those two things bring a diversity of thought. And so the first step is to get the table looking differently. The second step is, are you listening? You know, are we just meeting a quota or are we engaging with those people that now represent your community to really understand how you will carry out your mission or transform how you deliver health care in the communities that you serve? And it looks different in different parts of the country. And you've held leadership roles in many areas of the country, Texas, Oakland, California, now Idaho. Um, so what is unique about health equity in these very different settings? And then I guess what common threads still exist? Yeah, so uh, let me start with what I think the common threads are. And I think over the last 10 years, and I would, I would um, state that the first time I heard social determinants of health, was actually at an ACHE um, conference. Gosh, that must have been maybe 10, 15 years ago. But um, at Trinity Health, we we changed the the, uh, acronym a little bit. We really talk about the social influencers of health because we feel that as healthcare leaders and transformational deliverers of care and really focusing on healthy communities, Determinants almost is like a dead end street. And we feel that they really are influencers. And what we are engaged is changing or engaging on those social influencers and making a change to really um, improve the health of our communities. So I would say the thing that we all have in common is that we believe that the social influencers of health are really 
part and really responsible for health equities. Um, and we've all heard the, the uh, phrase, give me your zip code and I'll tell you your life expectancy mm -hmm. because we know 80% of an individual's health is determined by the behaviors, but also the social and environmental conditions in which they leave, live. So um, that's, I think, the common thread. I think uh, what sets them apart is the dynamics of the community. So some of the um, states that you uh, mentioned that I've been in and those communities, some have been rural, some have been urban. And I think that that's what differentiates maybe community to community. So for example, here in Idaho, we're a very rural state, right? And so we have our own unique um, issues. Uh, primarily Idaho is made up of uh, rural healthcare. And so that sets health equities um, to be challenged in different ways. When you talk about, uh, you know, when I was in Dallas or Oakland or um, Houston, those are very urban areas and they have their own um, differences in where health equities, what kind of communities we serve, where do you have the um, health inequities in those markets? Uh, in Boise, Idaho, for example, we're an urban part of a very rural area, so that brings their own dynamics. And we have a large refugee community, and St. Alphonsus uh, has a global clinic that is totally dedicated to uh, those refugees. And so making sure that our staff is well-educated, understands that refugee community, what are their challenges, really sets apart how we deal with the health inequities that they are facing every day that are really social, cultural, and uh, environmental. Yeah, great feedback there. Just a reminder for our listeners that this episode is brought to you by Elsevier. As misinformation multiplies, giving your clinicians easy access to the most trusted, current, evidence-based information is more important than ever. Elsevier's Clinical Key can help. Download the executive brief at trustclinicalkey.com. All right, Odette, after the, I guess we can call them turbulent events over the last two years, uh, we're talking about both the pandemic here and the social justice issues we've all seen rise to the forefront. Um, we've said it on this show before, many organizations are recommitting to DEI efforts. So what advice would you give to the leaders of those organizations as they, they truly take time to invest here in these mission critical efforts? Yeah, so um, you're absolutely right, Eric, that the last um, two years have really put a spotlight on health inequities and really asked community leaders and their companies to look at DE&I and what it really means. I would say, you know, this isn't a one and done. This is a journey that needs to continue to be effectively managed by the board and also by the CEO. And it's not just about showing statistics about, you know, how diverse your community, I mean, your board is, your community board is, or how di diverse your um, colleague or employee base is, but what are you doing to ensure that you're listening to those voices and making changes? So for example, um, as we got a more diverse uh, community board, there were different questions that were being asked based on everything that we've experienced, the social media that is out there regarding diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, so we're having very different conversations. And that's why I talked a little bit earlier about diversity in thought. Don't just think that you have a diverse um, board now and you're not introducing or allowing those voices to be heard. That I would say is first and foremost. Um, you know, many uh, colleagues, the workforce is changing, right? I, I, as I'm trying to answer that question, I think, wow, we've had the great resignation. We're trying to really understand what our um, healthcare providers, our frontline are looking for based on everything that they've experienced and all the uh, significant changes that we're seeing in our, our workforce. But we also need to understand that if we are looking for a diverse, uh, frontline that can actually help us 
understand the diversity of care that we need to deliver because they are a diverse group, we need to understand how they see the organization and how they see the organization making changes that positively or negatively affect them as a diverse representative of, of, of the organization. So it's not a one and done. It's a journey that you continue to have the conversation, to be willing to have the uncomfortable conversation that maybe you've not had. And, um, you know, I am a Hispanic female at a CEO um, level, and I would, you know, transparently say that I have my own unconscious bias, that just because I'm a diverse uh, leader doesn't mean that I know everything. And I have to also work at learning, having the conversation, being in that uncomfortable space and making decisions and uh, engaging in those conversations from not only my community, but also my board and for our colleagues. I love that, Odette. I love that you're passionate beyond your role at the hospital too. Let's talk about the work uh, you do outside uh, in the community. You know, you volunteer with several organizations that help advance DEI within the healthcare leadership field. For instance, uh, the Carol Emmett Fellowship Board we talked about, um, that's focused on mentoring exceptional women leaders. So tell us a little bit more about why this is so important to health equity and then obviously to you personally. Yeah. Well, I, I would say as, uh, you know, as a... Um, a Latino female leader, um, I was given great opportunities all through my career to advance and to get to the level that, um, that I'm at. And so it is just part of who I am to give help, to, you know, to give a handout and, and help people, uh, especially women to, uh, experience what I've been able to experience in my career and help them, um, see the possibilities right? It's all about seeing the possibilities that maybe they haven't had a chance uh, to see and to also uh, be given those uh, possibilities through their organizations. So um, the Carol Emmett Foundation is um, really focused on top leadership positions. And we know that um, women represent the large majority of healthcare workers, yet we have a small representation in top leadership roles. So the Carol Emmett Foundation is totally focused on how do we get women that are immensely, uh, immensely successful to then be able to take the next leap through uh, the program and mentoring that occurs um, through, that, um, through that foundation. But also the foundation is made up of two programs. The fellowship, where we bring in high-performing female leaders to take the next step, and also the equity collaborative, which works synergistically with the uh, fellowship to pave path for highly accomplished women in their own organization and the nation's health institutions to make significant progress in addressing gender equity and health equities across the board. So I, I feel very privileged to be part of that group and to really move not only health equity and the, the diverse thought forward, but giving women that are already incredible leaders a chance to explore what else they can do in their uh, leadership roles or even identifying a new leadership role that allows them to take their talents elsewhere. All right, Odette, finally, whenever we have an ACHE fellow on the podcast, we love to ask this question here. How has ACHE and your credential helped you navigate your career journey? Well, I thought I gave this a lot of thought and you heard me earlier on talk about, you know, one of uh, the talks that I heard and I've had, you know, I could name others. Um, it, it's been a real privilege to be part of ACHE. I joined ACHE 30 plus years ago when I was a student. Um, and it was a way to really get familiar and exposure to what was happening in the industry to learn about the innovation. And as I continued to be part of ACHE over my 30 years, not only have I met uh, new uh, friends uh, in the field that I can call and make a connection with, but also even my peers that I already knew, being able to 
share the experiences together at ACHE and bring uh, innovative solutions back to our organizations um, has really been beneficial uh, to me. And, and to just watch some of the most iconic leaders in healthcare be part of ACHE and uh, watch their journey um, has been really um, a benefit to me and a blessing. All right, Odette, thank you so much for spending some time with us on this edition of the Healthcare Executive Podcast. We cannot wait to see you soon in Chicago for this year's Congress on Healthcare Leadership. Thank you, Eric. It's been nice talking to you. Yeah, and always to learn more at ache.org slash Congress. And one, one more word of thanks for Elsevier, who brought you this episode as misinformation multiplies, giving your clinicians easy access to the most trusted current Evidence-based information is more important than ever. Elsevier's Clinical Key can help. Just download the executive brief at TrustClinicalKey.com. Thank you so much for listening, and we hope you'll join us next time on ACHE's Healthcare Executive Podcast. This has been the Healthcare Executive Podcast, brought to you by the American College of Healthcare Executives. If you've enjoyed the show, please consider rating and reviewing on iTunes or your podcasting app of choice. And for more information, find us online at ache.org.